but we've got a rich environment, so there's a lot of potential for the organisms to tap into rich uh, dynamic processes in the environment. So the final thing on top of all of that you need is a drive for continued evolution. So assuming we're looking at a natural selection system, uh, you can introduce selection pressure from limited resources, competition, etc. So, but that's not enough. Um, that will create a, a static adaptive landscape, but we need a um, changing adaptive, adaptive landscape to create continued drive for continued evolution. And essentially the way that comes about is that individuals should be part of the environment experienced by other individuals, leading to co-evolution, niche construction, ecosystem engineering, um, and those sorts of processes. Um, this connectedness can come about through food webs, or simply um, in the real world, just being there. Um, there are the, the physics of the environment is such that there's transmission of forces, transmissions of signals, semiotics. So there's just being in the environment um, affects <coughs> other individuals in that environment, and those sorts of things are generally missing from a life um, uh, systems. And I think that is the end of my talk. Just to summarise the five points that I've made, um, and also to say I'm also presenting these ideas at the Evo Evo workshop at the end of the conference. Um, and so there's an associated paper which is available on my website. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So we have time for uh, one question, and can the next speaker? Is there a question? Yes. With, um, I think it was point two. I was wondering, you, you were pointing out limitations of things being hard coded. Mm. But you have to hard code something, no? Uh -huh. you get the yes. all yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to hard code something, and so that's one of the sort of um, big questions. What, um, what is the appropriate level of coding, and to what extent can you code things at the lower level and have these processes sort of, um, built on top of it and evolve. I, I don't have answers to that question, I'm just raising the, the question as an, an important issue. Thank you, Tim. Let's see, the next on your PDF. Great, thank you. So I adopt a completely different perspective. Uh, I'm quite new in this, in this field. Uh, I started discussing this a lot in the workshop with uh, Wolfgang last year. And uh, when browsing the, the vast literature of on, on openness, I've been quite surprised. Of course, you have hundreds of references. Uh, you have two main <coughs> other ones, but two main ones that are yeah, that can be discussed. As Wolfgang said, it, you have continuous generation of novelty, you have continuous generation of complexity. You have unbounded evolution, you have life as a definition of open and this many, many other definitions. But you have a general claim in all the paper, or in quite all the paper, that life is open ended. And evolutionary evolution, uh, sorry, biological evolution is open ended. But if now you look at evolutionary biology, the field of evolutionary biology, and you look for open ended content, open endedness concept in this field, you, have, you find no pain. So I've been quite surprised to see that you have hundreds of references in a life on open-endedness. And you have almost or no references in biological science. And so I try to understand, and I want to discuss with you, why is this paradox, or is it a paradox, and try to understand whether it helps us to define open-ended evolution, and maybe answer the question whether life itself is really or not open-ended. So that's the first answer. Why do biologists don't use the concept? The first answer is probably historical. Uh, from the very beginning of uh, modeling in <coughs> biological evolution, evolutionary biologists use models that focus on stable states. For instance, uh, all the models that are based on game theory, they mainly focus on evolutionary stable strategies. So they focus on finding the strategies that are stable and that cannot be evaded by mutants, by new mutants in the population. So of course, with this kind of model, you cannot be open. -ended. Similarly, you have other models like, of course, you'll know the fitness landscape models or the right fusion models. And these models often 
uh, focus on stable fitness landscape, and so in this kind of model, you cannot have component neither. And the last part of it is that uh, if now you look at molecular biology, molecular biologists consider selection as, or often consider selection as a stabilizing force. You know, they, 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 they speak of purifying selection, in that selection is mainly acting by remo removing uh, harmful mutation than by adding new beneficial mutation. And this can be measured in a real organism by just comparing two extant organisms, to compare two different sequences, and you, you measure what they call dn versus ds, so dn is mutation you observe, or difference you observe in non-coding position of the gene, ds is the difference you observe in coding position of the gene, and the ratio gives you the information whether the selection in this organism is purifying, stabilizing, or directional, meaning that it goes to new organisms. And if you look at external organisms, this is a paper by Colin and Wolf in four years ago, this is uh, in blue to uh, eukaryote, so human and, and the monkey. Here it's to fungi, and here it's to bacteria. You see that the ratio between DN and DS is strongly below one, meaning that selection in these organisms is mainly purifying. That is, <coughs> evolution is mainly stabilizing the phenotypes than evolving the phenotypes, at least in extant organisms. Uh, but there's another way to look at this question is that if now you go deeper in the, in the papers in biology, you have novelty everywhere. If you look at the neutral theory, the neutral theory say that you have a continuous input of new mutations. Neutral new mutations, but continuous novelty. Go back to the idea of Wolfgang, Bob, you have to distinguish the different kinds of novelty. A novelty can be neutral, whether it is open-ended is another question. Now, if you look at quasi-species, for instance, which is another theory, another kind of model, then, in particular, in viruses, you have a high level of genetic variation in the quasi-species model, saying that you cannot consider a species as a be being a single uh, uh, kind of, of a single genotype and a single, a single individual, but rather being a cloud of individuals moving inside the cloud. So you have novelty everywhere, at least in, in this uh, quasi-species uh, concept or models. And last, for instance, you also have many ideas, like I think uh, evolution, just a few, few minutes before, that if you have co-evolution, then selection will never rest because evolution at some part of the ecosystem will induce need to have adaptation at other parts of the ecosystem. So you have continuous, you have everywhere in evolutionary biology the idea of novelty, but nowhere in biology the idea of open-endedness. So why again? Actually, if you look now, if you go back to alive papers, you have exactly the same idea, that not all kind of novelties are equivalent. And if you look at the papers on, on open-endedness, or papers that talk of open-endedness in the literature, then very often you will find the idea that you need novelty, but major novelty, adaptive novelty, or novelty that is not cycling, sorry, Tim, it's your, your, your paper, all right. <coughs> so, Back to the idea of Wolfgang, probably we have to distinguish between classes of novelty. Not all novelties are, are equivalent. And now, if back again to biology, do we distinguish different classes of novelty in biology? Yes. Novelty in neutral theory is novelty on the sequence that has no consequence in, on the phenotype. Novelty in population genetics is different. Novelty in uh, quasi species theory is different. So maybe we can go back to biology and understand what kind of novelty biologists do consider in evolution. And actually, if you look at all these kind of novelty, two of them, according to me, are closer to the open-ended evolution concept. One is co-evolution with the red queen effect, with, uh, so, uh, the, the, back to the idea that when you have co-evolution, you induce novelty uh, by interaction between the species. But back to evolutionary stable strategies. Again, there, in co-evolution, biologists are looking to stable states of the ecosystem. But there's another kind of novelty in biology, which is the major evolutionary transition of St. Marie and Maynard Smith, which was published uh, 20 years ago. And the idea is this is a new kind of novelty which involves changes not in the individuals, but in the way information is stored and transmitted in the, in, in, in the individuals. And the idea I would like to propose here is that 
this is the most important idea of open-endedness, which is the emergence of novelty that leads to new individuality in the system. The important thing is that you, before the novelty, you are looking at some individuals. After the novelty, the individual you consider are different. So the idea going to me is that the, the interesting, the most interesting thing in open-endedness is that the definition of what is an individual will change during the evolution. So this is the, the different classes of major transition given by, by the Saint Marie. It's not the, the original paper, it's a new paper published last year. But so the, one of the questions <coughs> is can we <coughs> build some <coughs> levels on the bottom of, the, of this list? I'm not sure of that. Because if often an evolution is evolution of, of, of individuality, we can go back, yeah, thanks, it's my last slide. We can go back to biology again and consider that biology, biological theory and evolution biology say it's something important. We have neutral theory that is admitted and almost proven, which say that if you have a mutation that gives an advantage S, it has a fixation probability proportional to the size of the population. Actually, the probability of fixation is the product of the size of the population and the advantage of the mutation. And now consider major <coughs> transition, and what saint Marie and Menard Smith say to us is that new individualities are entities that were, that were capable of independent replication before and that can only replicate a part of a larger unit after. So the number of units you can consider in your population will automatically shrink while you add new levels in your evolution. <coughs> and so we can conjecture that the possible uh, size of effective, effective, effective size of the population will decrease exponentially as you add new layers in your organization. And what I would like to conjecture here is that if you have a universe of m elements, you can only implement a maximum of m divided by 2 power l individual at the level l. And since mutations will have a lower and lower probability to fix in the population, then you will rapidly, exponentially exhaust all the possibility of your simulation. This is very important for simulation because we have a limit to all. But probably we will also exhaust the possibility of the biosphere. Okay. So, not sure life is really open at the end. Of course, for a simulation, you can have some tricks in simulation. And some tricks can be, for instance, an exponential increase of S. If you have an exponential increase of S in your fitness landscape, meaning that you have very steep fitness landscape, then you can continue to evolve even though the number of individuals is limited. Thank you. Does this lunch break start at 11? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we should move on. Thanks, Thanks very much. Dave, you have your, is your presentation? Yeah, I think it's here. Excellent. Well, this is uh, a perfect way to, to follow up on the previous speaker because I want to say uh, the same thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good chance to make up a lot of time. Uh, um, I'm thinking from the software point of view, I'm thinking from the digital computing point of view, I could give a crap about real biology. Uh, um, and it seems to me obvious that <coughs> Um, if we're going to have true evolution, open-ended evolution, we're going to have major evolutionary transitions uh, of Seth Martin and uh, John Maynard Smith, uh, or else whatever we have is not open-ended evolution. And so I will recapitulate the argument that was just made, that if we observe open-ended evolution over time, the individuals are going to get bigger and slower that we are considering. That's what it means. And if we are in a finite system, eventually we will reach a population size of one that lives forever, and evolution will stop, by definition. Uh, like that. Okay. So if we actually want philosophical, theoretical, true open-ended evolution, it has to be an infinite system in the end. It has to be an indefinitely large system in the end. Now that may be completely irrelevant because all of the complexity that you could ever want and all the things that could keep you watching the simulation until you drop 
could happen in a completely finite system. It's all a matter of time and scale. Sure. Space-time body. So the first point is there's a lot of stuff we do where we take for granted what the creature is, or in the Packard and Bedell language, we take it for granted what the component is that we are attempting to measure evolutionary activity of. And if we do that, we are dead. If we are do that, if we are stuck with the component that we have, and we cannot say now an exponential number of those guys, or even a linear number of those guys, I don't care, come together to form a transformer that marches down the road, whatever it is, uh, um, then we're stuck at the level that we started at. And we are going to observe, at best, climbing some kind of hill, perhaps very slowly, perhaps moving through some high hyperspace bypasses and ravines before we stop. And maybe that, in fact, is as much open-ended evolution as we could hope to observe until we redefine what the components are. And let's go right to see it. So what I would like to propose is if we're going to have a satisfying, truly notion of open-ended evolution, and I'm not sure it's even available. Uh, I'm not sure if just, that's just one of the fantasy things that we induce from looking at very limited data. But if we want, we should be looking at it in a way that the components, the things that we think are evolving, are observables in the data and not priors that we define and put upon the system. Okay, That's step one. So uh, um, if we cannot say, OK, consider a creature k, consider a population n of creatures k, if we can't do that, then what do we do? You have to hard code something. Well, what we do is we start with an artificial chemistry or an artificial physics. We start one level down. And we say, yeah, we're willing to keep this, this level, absolutely fixed. We're willing to postulate this and say everything has to happen above that. But it has to happen above that and above that and above that and above that. So we're going to find our components. We're going to find our creatures that are reproducing things inside some kind of artificial physics or chemistry. What kind? of artificial physics or chemistry should it be. Okay. One of the great joys and sins <coughs> of artificial life is that we get to make up the laws of physics anew for every damn paper. <laughs> and that's why people from the outside, by the way, think it's all crap. Sure, you could make it happen. You could hear it. How could it not happen? Uh, and then the next paper, you could hear it. How could it not happen? Uh, uh, now, of course, we know that life had to be that in the limit because life did happen, but it's not very satisfying. So the proposal I made last year at A Life, the proposal that has become my purpose in life, so it's part of every talk I give, is that satisfying models should be indefinitely scalable. It's not, it's unacceptable to say, I have a 100 by 100 array. You can say, uh, I have a rule, an update rule, that applies to anything. I'm going to do experiments on a 100 by 100 array and also a 200 by 200 array or whatever it is. But nothing changes about the framing of the model that couldn't be scaled up to arbitrarily large. And we all nod our heads and say, oh yeah, my model. Uh, uh, but it turns out there are things that are not quite so obvious that don't scale. And the classic one for a life is a synchronous clock. The classic one for a life is imagining we can have deterministic, synchronous models, indefinitely scalably large. You cannot. So Conway's game of life, all traditional serial <coughs> deterministic automata out the window. Can't have that. So this argument has some bite. This argument says certain models are admissible, certain ones are not. Okay. So there's an increasing pile of papers about indefinite scalability. And basically, if you're willing to adopt a probabilistic cellular atomic, where the probabilistic is reasonably real, so that you can't just assume away, I'll just do a triple modular redundancy and assume away the probability, then you're, you're probably OK. Because cellular atomic is spatially local. So they don't have a global clock. They don't have any global uh, synchronization requirements. So they're mostly good. But you have to give up on determinism. You have to give up on 100% reliability. If you're ready to do that, you're ready to build models that in some at least 
some way, simple way, could be transformable into other non-deterministic and detrimental scalable models. There is a hope that we could start having actually, instead of a brand new laws of physics in every paper, we can say, I am using an indefinitely scalable model. I am using an indefinitely scalable model. And in fact, we could think of a polynomial transform between his indefinitely scalable model and his indefinitely scalable model, and actually start to build up some progress. That's it. All right, how do I make this thing go? All right, third try. Here's my fantasy. I've talked to a couple of people about this since I've got here because I wasn't sure whether this has already been done or proved impossible. And I don't know that either is true. But it seems to me this is what we ought to be able to do. Suppose you say, here is a digital cube, a billion by a billion by a billion. And one of the x and y is going to be a two-dimensional world, and t is going to be time. So we have this cube of bits. And we can take that as our model, and we can impose it upon reality any way we like. A finite volume of space-time granularity. Okay? So we could make individual bits and go all the way down to quarks or Higgs bosons or whatever we want. Or we could make those individual bits represent cells or people or planets. It's up to us. But we have this finite realm of space and time. And the question is, is evolution happening inside that? And if so, is evolution, open-ended evolution, happening inside that? Okay. And then we could say, we'll move our box around. We'll zoom in, we'll zoom out, we'll put it over here, we'll put it over there, and we'll look. And the way we do it is, okay, put your box someplace. You put it at the size of cells. So you really do not care about electrons. You're going to make some globbed model of everything below that and just live with it. Great. It's your choice. Okay. Uh, um, look at the first slice of time, do a spatial autocorrelation, shift that thing against itself, and look for repeating patterns. Look for nearly perfect repeating patterns. If you look for really perfect repeating patterns, you'll find crystals. Spatially, absolute repeating patterns. You want nearly repeating. Nearly different, but similar. And those are ones that are candidates for components. Those are the ones that are candidates to be creatures. And then you take those and you look over successive slices of time and you connect them together based on adjacency to make putative life lines. This guy at this slice is probably this guy at this slice. It's probably this guy at this slice. Oh, now there's two of them. They're probably related. You take the lifelines and you project them across time to get a phase space. Where now you have a line moving around corresponding to each lifeline. And you see how far it gets in the phase space compared to a random walk in that same phase space. And that's the neutral model, the shadow. And if it moves, you have evolution. If you can take then that model and zoom out to a larger scale and see those things happening again, then you have open-ended evolution. It's all on us, but it should all be post hoc. And that, I propose to you, is if we haven't done it already, and I wish someone would say we had, a research proposal for the Grand Challenge for Open Education. Thank you. Great. We are out of time for this first session. So there's a coffee break, and we are going to, I guess the coffee break, they're already drinking the coffee out there. Oh, okay. that's right. Um, so we want to get our coffee, but we're going to start here probably again at 10.20. Forty minutes ago. Eleven twenty. We'll do that. Thanks.